that's why I'm asking you. Started the last room. Okay, yeah, and I'll just put it on talk space and then we can start. Oh, we should um, ask their consent to be first. I thought it was in the what's called. Wasn't it a new event briefing? With the, with the, with the
will um, teach for Australia and will run his joint event, which is a public debate on the future of education. The topic is that the classroom has no place in the 21st century. And we're really, really excited to have such influential players in education speak to us tonight with their thoughts on this issue. Um, so before we get started, we'll each talk a little bit about our respective organisations. Um, I'll hand over to Wahidi first to talk, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Wurundi, to talk about ANU Student Media. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> so hi everyone, my name is Wahid and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Wurundi. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respect to their elders, both past and present. Um, so Veroni is the ANU student newspaper and we have, we have a storied history of facilitating conversation of relevant and engaging topics ever since the paper was formally established in 1950. Tonight promises to be no different as we have some eminent minds in the field, um, in the education field, here to debate the future direction of teaching. These people are infinitely more knowledgeable than I am, so I won't take up any more time. I hope that everybody enjoys the night and enjoys the debate from some intellectual powerhouses. Uh, thank you, Lee. So I'm the campus ambassador for Teach for Australia, and we're very lucky to have tonight with us also um, Melody, who is the founder and the CEO of Teach for Australia. So a little bit about the organisation before we start the debate. Teach for Australia is a graduate, a two-year graduate program, which is all about empowering um, and equipping high potential graduates with all the skills they need to make a difference in a disadvantaged classroom. So the conversation we're going to have is hopefully going to illuminate the fact that education isn't just about what happens in a school and what happens in a classroom. It's about a concerted effort of policymakers and leaders of industries to come up with innovative solutions so that we can prepare our youth and our students for a rapidly changing world. To do that, we need people in those industries and in those policy-making spheres to care about education and to understand the real constraints that some students face in seeking that education. Yeah. Teach for Australia works in that area to um, give high potential graduates a lifelong interest. I hope you enjoy the debate tonight. And um, while the debate is occurring, please think of some questions to ask the speakers so you can put them put them to them in the um, question and answer session afterwards. Um, so I'd like to introduce the first speaker of the affirmative team, um, Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, who's the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic of the AM. I'd like to welcome you all this evening, and thank you in particular for squeezing yourselves into those beautiful graces. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for all sitting there patiently as I talk way too slowly. I'd like to thank you as I talk way too fast and you miss the next point. I don't care if you've heard it before because ladies and gentlemen, you are all here to tear yourselves for me. <laughs> Michael Turvey, are you listening? Yes, because it's not about you, it's actually about me. Ladies and gentlemen, the age of classroom learning has passed and the age of personalised learning is here. Stop sitting there like sitting there things, passively allowing yourselves to be talked at by people for about an hour. Give in to the age of personalised learning because as we will demonstrate tonight, we have no choice socially, economically, and the train has already passed. This is not the age of mass learning where your needs, your desires are ignored by the person up the front who just wants it all to be about them. This is the age where we need to, for social reasons, economic reasons, get in touch with our learners and show how we're going to change this nation and the world for the better to address things like inequality. A word about the other team. <laughs> they have the young, the radical, and the rock star. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a thing too about rock stars. One moment they tell you they're in favour of open access textbooks, the next minute they tell you they're $53 million in debt and can you pray for them? What they really want is for you to give them money. Okay? <laughs> so just be very, very careful. Don't be gulled by the Labrador puppy eyes. <laughs> because you will hear hard facts, just don't even look, hard facts, the cruel 
truth that we have allowed ourselves to be bent and bowed and sat in grey seats for hundreds and hundreds of years and we know it doesn't work. Shame. <laughs> Our argument is threefold. First of all, while more people are participating in education in Australia globally and in Australia, that participation rate has not generated a reduction in inequality. There is no change in the number of people with low socioeconomic backgrounds going to universities and completing degrees than there were 20 years ago. Yes, women are now allowed to come to university. Thank you so very much for that university. But we've just learned that women who get science degrees are more likely to be unemployed. And oh, by the way, science degrees are like new arts degrees. And if science degrees are like new arts degrees, why don't you just do an arts degree? Let's not be around the bush here. So there's an issue with equality. And not just in Australia, but globally. Millions of people globally are unable to gain access to education because there is no education infrastructure. While well, we wait for the classrooms to be built and the teachers to be trained, they miss out day and day again, and it gets worse. Secondly, I don't know if you noticed this, but Australia is not doing that well educationally globally. Our PISA results are lousy. Our students who are gifted are not being identified. They're hiding themselves in classrooms. We have mass participation, but no mass improvement. There's been some improvement with students with low literacy and low numeracy gaining in the classroom, but overall our profile is going backwards. Does it mean that we have to adopt education systems like Korea, where we force students to sit in classrooms for hours and hours at a time? No, because the question is not one of time served, the question is not one of being held in place, the question is effectiveness of outcome. The problem is when you sit in a classroom with 30 people, 300 people, 3,000 people, we don't know who you are, we don't know what your name is, we don't know what your learning journey is, and our counter model is to propose that this needs to give way to the age of personalised learning, where we use adaptive technologies and we use human contact to make sure we do know who you are, we set up a personalised learning plan and we ensure that you are going to achieve the goals that are going to get you to the job you want, to the qualification you want, and that we are going to get to the economy that we need. And that's the issue with the PISA results. More and more people are going to university in Australia, but we are still a resources dependent economy. We are not shifting our economy in the way that we need to. Our education system is falling behind. Our IP is not being generated at the rate of other countries. And this is because we are trying a one-size-fits-all approach to education. Unless we understand who our learners are and move on, we will continue to allow people to opt out of maths, to opt out of science, to do those science degrees that might not get them a job to make decisions that mean that they don't do tertiary packages and go to university, but opt into to pathways where they are stuck forever in jobs that are not going to help them and not going to help Australia. So there are fundamental inequalities that are really there as a result of classroom learning. Yeah, it's the status quo and we can continue to bear with the status quo, but it is unacceptable to allow inequality to prevail. It's unacceptable to allow the economy to continue to drift. And third of all, and this is the king word, the age of classroom learning really has passed because as one of you just said on the way through the door, if this were really a live class, you wouldn't have come. <laughs> and that's the truth of it. The data we've been collecting across ANU and the thermal calendar shows that if this were week three or week four of a teaching course, you wouldn't be here. You would have stuck coming two weeks ago and you wouldn't be downloading either. But you would still be learning, you'd still be gaining knowledge and you'd still be passing at a rate better than your peers five years ago and ten years ago. You're acquiring your knowledge through the web. You're doing so through peer-to-peer -peer learning. You're learning outside, you're learning in cafes, you're learning with one another. You're not necessarily learning in the classroom. I can pin you down, I can put you in the classroom, I can put RFID chips on your legs to make sure you turn up. <laughs> but I know you'll be cruising your Facebook, and that's what you're doing right now, isn't it, Jonathan? <laughs> oh, no. okay. The truth is, I can hold you in a physical space, I can put a teacher in front of you, but it will never capture your mind. And as Eric Bazur showed at MIT, when you put mind sensors on students and follow them around, that they are more brain dead in a lecture than when they are asleep. I know you don't like getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning, I know you don't like coming to class on Fridays. 
I know you don't like sitting in grey seats. I know you don't like these tiny tables with the horrible wheels on them. So why do we keep doing this to you? And why do we provide a mass approach to education where we assume that all of you need the same thing at the same speed, in the same language, and assume that it's all okay? The truth is we don't know, and we should know. We should know who you are, we should know what you need, and we should be supporting a personalised learning journey for you. That doesn't mean that we're getting rid of teachers, let me be very clear. Teachers can be there available as coaches, as facilitators, but we want to recognise that most of you probably learn more from your peers than you do from the lectures that you don't attend and you don't download. So let's get honest here. Let's look at the data. Instead of following perhaps lovely anecdotal stories about great classroom teachers we've all known, and I'm not suggesting that we go out and exterminate teachers, I think they're great, but the truth is, the issue is that at fundamental, bottom level, classroom learning is about mass learning, and mass learning is about non-recognition of the self. It's called, in new trendy digital talk, mediation. We actually want disintermediation, which in Uber talk is get rid of the guys in the taxis and let me just hire the teacher, pay what I want, get the learning I want, and drive in the economy. Unlease it, unloosen it, let it go, let it thrive, and stop making us do things that we did in 1500 and think it's all okay. So ladies and gents, are you bored yet? <laughs> no, you're not, because I've been short. You're probably recording it on your phone anyway. You're probably talking through Twitter and on Facebook. The truth is, the age of learning has passed into the age of the digital. It's your age, take it in your hands. If you're offered the two pills, you know which one to take. Don't take their pill, don't take it. Because if you take it, all the colours will wash away and you will indeed find yourself in the grey seat confined for the rest of your life with hundreds of other people who won't know your name, who won't know your learning journey and, ladies and gentlemen, we will not have helped Australia or the world to get better and more equal. Thank you. of classroom-led education as we move into the 21st century. This evening, I will be arguing that online platforms should be used to enhance what is taught in the face-to-face -face classroom environment, not to replace it. I will highlight the harmful impact that classroom-free that classroom -free education system would have on campus culture and why, that, why it is so important that a physical campus culture remains. I will also address Marnie's comments regarding personalised learning and how a personalised learning structure should absolutely involve face-to-face -face classroom teaching as well. And as Marnie um, incorrectly said, for cl classroom teaching absolutely does not have to be en masse and it can be personalised as well. Let me paint the picture for you of an ANU where classroom teaching no, no longer exists. The land is abandoned. <laughs> the only building that is still occupied is the newly constructed Tripoli, Chipley Library monstrosity with its high-tech interface and its automatic book retrieval system that has already taken away the jobs of dozens and dozens of librarians. There is no longer an issue with noise. People do not talk anymore. They don't know how to. <laughs> they stare at their computer screens, earphones in, their eyes have become weird octagonal shapes on their evolutionary path to becoming squares, just as my granny said they would. <laughs> you can leave Chipley Library and stroll along the grounds. The art centre was never rebuilt. <laughs> you couldn't want to encourage discipline where people actually interact and express themselves. Nothing can be saved here. 
Stanley Road is a series of sterile haunted mansions that the university <laughs> once spent millions of dollars redeveloping. Vines and moss will hang from their ceilings. The Bergman front lawn is a permanent jungle land. A better jungle, the university says, than the one they used to visit on Wednesday nights in O Week. But the alumni will disagree. The Bruce Fountain spurts water no more. There is no coffee grounds, no counselling centre. There is no need for parking offices. There is no meat sushi. <laughs> they have all gone, just like the students. This new breed of the ANU thought leader doesn't actually go here. They don't know what it is like to wait 90 minutes to get into an Anusa party. They don't know that there are actually real people that can help you with stress and mental health, not just online counsellor bots. They do not know what it is like to sit and have lunch in Union Court or to celebrate the Holly Festival on the Chipley Meadows. They don't know our campus. Campus does not exist. Campus is now Wattle's better looking cousin. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is fundamentally bad. And we on the negative are firmly against this as the future of educational institutions. Marnie tonight has spoken about personalised learning. But personalised learning, in the opinion of the negative team, allows, if not encourages, the inclusion of classroom learning. This is not to say that we have a preference for the traditional regimented lecture tutorial structure that we still see today. But this structure should be built upon and should evolve. At the moment, I'm doing a course that has assessment menus, shout out to Andrew, you're doing well, which allows students to choose their level of engagement and dedication to, a, to the class. It also allows the lecturer and the tutor to set realistic expectations for individual students based on the assessment menu they choose. The assessment also caters to your learning type. You can pick from a list of different assessments and there is everything from essays to presentations and pictures to videos. You can pick and choose what suits you and add it up to 100% as you like. That, ladies and gentlemen, is personalised learning and that is including the classroom and it is also integrating online components. And it is happening with different layers of discourse and interaction so that students of all different, of all different learning types are well catered for. I simply don't buy um, Maani's argument that teachers will know who students are on a purely online forum. Maani is also a big advocate for MOOCs. MOOCs have tens of thousands of students. Maani, some of my lecturers that have 100 students in it don't even know my name. And how is that not a one-size-fits-all model? How is a MOOC that has over 10,000 students in it, how is that not mass learning, ladies and gentlemen? I'm not, arguing, I'm not arguing on the negative that we should reinforce draconian classroom instruction. Classroom teaching should always be evolving and utilising technology where applicable or where it allows for increased engagement and especially accessibility to material for students. Of course classroom teaching needs to evolve. Of course classroom teaching needs to change. Classroom teaching in Australia needs to change to better cater for students who experience social anxiety, who are blind, who come from a wide range of different backgrounds with a wide range of lived experience, including and especially those who speak a language other than English in their homes. And it's um, and a classroom where students do learn from their peers. But studies around the world have told us that human interaction is absolutely essential for our psychological development. And studies, including ones by Anna Yanini, show that student success and satisfaction is higher in face-to-face -face platforms than in online modes of teaching. I want you, ladies and gentlemen, to think about the impact of a world without classrooms and the impact that that would have on those groups that I have just mentioned to you. Groups that we identify in this university as often being isolated in comparison to their peers. Instead of trying to improve our under-resourced system, we what? Give up and send it online. Why? Because it's cheaper and because it's just too hard. And ladies and gentlemen, I say that that is not bloody good enough. <laughs> Education should be every government's number one funding priority. If you educate your people, everything else, including the creation of jobs, a better infrastructure, and gaining your beloved budget surpluses will all fall into place. 
Ridding the education system of classroom teaching is a cheap way to fix an industry that needs updating. Fixing the classroom teaching model in both universities and in schools is going to take time and it is going to take a truckload of money, but it should be a national priority and once you take it away, it is going to be goddamn hard to ever bring it back and I think that would be an absolute disgrace.
Now, those opposite will have you think that the comparison is between having a great professor and a great online course. To them, and to those of you watching on live stream, who might actually have internet access, unlike those of us in the room, <laughs> I suggest you go to the website Professor or Hobo. <laughs> the great thing about the website Professor or Hobo is it rolls you up a set of pictures of people who have been living homeless in the street for more than a decade and people who are attending faculty at the university. <laughs> and what you notice from that website is it's surprisingly hard to tell you. <laughs> and so the comparison for many people is between a great MOOC and a lousy classroom research. Some of this is reflected too in university experiences. In last year, a Monash University science law student was halfway through a science lecture, he walked out from the room and proposed marriage to a female student. That proposal has now racked up over two and a half thousand views on the Monash, Monash stalker space. In a linear algebra and differential equations class, so reportedly two guys entered the room during an exam and began to fire super soakers randomly at students. Could this happen to you in the company of your own home? I submit not. <laughs> And think now what reducing the number of classrooms could do for that major camera challenge of housing affordability. This wouldn't be a Mad Max campus, this would be a campus in which spaces like the one we're currently in could be opened up as shared accommodation opportunities, massively increasing the supply of housing on campus and turning the university into a place where not just an elite few could live, but every student who wanted to be at the Australian National University. Online learning is the future, it is the better future, uh, and if you want to be free of prof professors or hobos, I'll ask you very kindly to vote for us in person or online at the end of the day. Thanks very much. I wasn't cowed into grey seats. I was catapulted out of my circumstances to be the first in my family to have the privilege of attending four full years of university classrooms, much less to go on and experience classrooms at, at Harvard as part of my master's degree. And I've also had the great fortune to experience and examine thousands of classrooms and their effects first as a management consultant, then later on working in Cape York with Noel Pearson, and ultimately in the work that I've been engaged now with for a better part of a, of a decade with Teach for Australia and the over 3,000 classrooms and 85,000 young people um, that we work with in our mission to confront and break the cycle of educational disadvantage. So when I hear progressive ideas that classroom learning has no place in modern times, that some combination of online technology with problem-based, personalized learning, 
experiential, uh, to increase access, that somehow that is inconsistent with the physical construct of a classroom seems a very long bow to draw. And surely multiple forms can exist together coherently. I can be both 51% online and the other 49 face to face, and that be okay. To me, a classroom is kind of like a, a car, a vehicle. There's a world of choice and models. You can be a petrol buzzing clunker, guzzling clunker, or a new technology Tesla. You can seat one or many. You can drive some from the front and others can drive you. You might care about speed over reliability or global responsibility. These are choices that you can make, both as a consumer, the passenger, and the driver as a teacher. It is possible that classrooms can involve just like the Model T has evolved to the modern Tesla, and just like a hobo can become a hero in the right classroom for kids who need them most. So the question, it seems, is not whether classroom learning has a place, because it clearly does. It's the question for me, the bigger question, is what is it really for? What is the purpose of education in the first place? That will help us best understand the, the, the modalities through which it's best delivered. And this is perhaps where many classrooms, yes, could use an overhaul, but the path to do that is pretty clear. In the world of Googling, facts are accessible instantaneously. Knowledge has become a commodity. What we know we need, what the Melbourne Declaration actually tells us is required, is more than simple knowledge that you can just download from the, from the internet. Our jobs, and indeed the future of our physical world, requires us to build competencies. Competencies of problem solving, in collaboration, in socialization, not isolation, in citizenship, in purpose. And it's, it's not that without face-to-face -face teaching, you know, somehow all this could be accomplished. It, it requires it. Debating in and of itself requires a, a classroom, a, a place where people can come together and battle about with their ideas. Let's not throw baby, the baby out with the bathwater. At Teach for Australia, we look to unleash some of our country's most talented graduates and professionals into the classrooms where they're needed most. And I would remind Andrew that in his own research in a former life, he noted that students from disadvantaged backgrounds in particular have the most to gain from a great teacher inside a great classroom. So I'm reminded of Majiska. Najiska is a student, a former student of one of our teachers uh, who experienced a lot of dislocation in her life, uh, moving about from, uh, effectively homeless, moving about from place to place. At 15, she worked 25 hours a week to support herself and her family, and she was starting to skip school and have very dark thoughts. But she came to school because there was a societal expectation that that's what one does at the age of 15, that you can't just kind of follow uh, the, the, the troubles in your life and opt out. And so instead, her Teach for Australia teacher combined compassion with high expectations. He created a classroom where she felt connected to her peers. And with his support and those of her peers inside a classroom, Najisma went from being a, an almost certain dropout to school captain. She graduated and she's now working with other young people who face adversity. So I've had the privilege of working intimately now with over 400 Teach for Australia associates, 3,000 classrooms, 85,000 students, and we always start with the question, what is your classroom for? What do your students need? And trust me, the answers that they can come back with can be delivered in a highly personalized setting inside the four physical walls of a classroom. For some, like Trini, who was in our second cohort and taught out in regional Victoria, he knew that the kids that he was teaching needed options. They needed access. So he set goals with them, personalized goals, and he found ways for his students to master the subjects that he was working with them, to become passionate about it. And he went from being one of the youngest ever teachers uh, hired to having a class whose average study score was in the top 10% of the state, was the highest in the school's history, and as a result, his kids had choices they never had before. For others like Kate, her students needed connection. They needed a bit of life perspective. 
So she took them down the street. She moved her classroom to another classroom each week where they worked collaboratively all year long with students with special needs and forged protective bonds in a community that maybe they, those bonds hadn't existed before. Richard and Justin, two other uh, alumni, came together and realized that the way that maths was traditionally being taught in the classroom wasn't good enough, so they evolved it. And they created an e-learning curriculum called Math Pathways. And so what they've done is not throw out the classroom, but instead bring technology in that allows for complete personalization, complete differentiation, whilst at the same time working with teachers to improve their classroom practice and intervention. And finally, there's David, a physicist and a researcher who shot lasers into the atmosphere while stationed in Antarctica and was one of many who helped to contribute to the gravitational waves discovery. His students need science to be sexy. And so he finds ways to make that happen in his science classroom. And he takes them to other classrooms, other laboratories, runs lots of experiments, and, and helps them tackle real life problems that need solving. For every dud class that the, the affirmative would, would have you think that somehow you know, uh, justifies a, a move away, each of us in this room can remember an excellent class and an excellent teacher. And for so many of our young people, like Majiska, classrooms are their ticket out of disadvantage towards a life of opportunity and choice, just like mine was. I'd like to thank Melody for your speech and welcome. And welcome Beth, who is a teacher at Melrose High School and was also the founder of the Raising Hope Education Foundation. Okay, good evening everyone. It's lovely to be here, uh, particularly amongst these radicals, which I think we could characterise as extremists with that dystopian <laughs> fantasy that we were given before. I was a little bit concerned when, when Marnie was uh, here at the start, she talked about uh, the inspiration and the, the radical, but I, as, as I've listened to this, I'm progressively more concerned about, about, about our side, but I think it might have been a little bit, uh, maybe, maybe we were misunderstood, maybe a bit of clarification is needed, because as Marnie pointed out at the start, it's all about the future of our classrooms making sure that they're positive, hopeful, and optimistic. What we want is we want a bridge between the current kind of lame, boring, dusty classroom and the future of MOOCs. We want to bridge that divide. It's all about having the teacher in the classroom. As she said, we value and respect teachers. We want the teacher to be there. We want students to be in school but the learning has to be personalised. So, a few years ago, <clears throat> we had a, a former Prime Minister, uh, the, the gutsy former Prime Minister Gillard, and she said that uh, great teachers can teach sitting on the ground under the trees, but we shouldn't ask them to. And that was all about Gonski funding, ensuring that our schools have the access to resources to provide the type of individualised learning that we on the affirmative side want to see. We want to make sure that every student has access to the services and support that they need to learn in a school in a way that respects the context that they come from, that doesn't treat them as a number, that doesn't treat a classroom as it is in many places today that everything has to be standardised. This growth of standardised testing, it concerns us. But three years later, three Prime Ministers later, <laughs> we're here and we're discussing the merits of classroom learning, the current classroom learning. Now, yes, there may be some beautiful anomalies, and thank you, Melody, for illustrating our point. We, we love that. We really appreciate it. But, um, but what we're really looking at is, is more of like the metadata, you know? We're looking at the broad landscape. We're looking at what's really going on. I mean, who knows, in another three years, uh, we might have Prime Minister Andrew Lee. Yeah. <laughs> it could be in high office, you know? Deputy PM Brian, you never know. A dream tipping. 
But, but what we really have here, what we really have here is we have a little bit of a myth. And it's a myth that the other side like to perpetuate. It's a myth of the classroom. It's something that's conjured up in literature. I mean, just think of Albus Dumbledore. Think of Miss Honey or John Keating. Amazing teachers. And we love, we love and admire the teachers. And particularly me, coming from the public education system, I love and admire what we're doing with the kids in our classrooms. But we must acknowledge that the system that we have designed is not supporting these teachers to adequately individualise, to personalise and to integrate technologies into the classroom to ensure that the children that go to school in Australia grow up knowing that they can follow their passion, that they can believe in themselves, gain confidence and feel worthy. So what we've laid out today is we've laid out the fact that mass participation in standardised schools that thrive on conformity, where behaviour management is key in a classroom of 32 students. And I see uh, some representatives of the AEU here today and I think we, we can all agree that smaller class sizes are good for students. And that allows teachers, it allows these great teachers to further personalise to differentiate. But we must acknowledge that for many classrooms around Australia, it's just not happening today. Teachers are trying their hardest, but they are being worn down by a system that just does not support them. And it's not good enough. We, on the affirmative team, we look to the future. We've also seen these PISA results. We're looking at the backwards trend of how we're performing. We need to individualise and personalise because this, fundamentally, is the great equaliser for these kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's very, very important that as a society, we look to students who come from contexts where their future could have been written in a way that crushes their hopes and dreams. And what we make sure that we give these students the best possible opportunity to learn in an environment where their passions and their interests are nurtured. And that is through what we propose. The model where teachers have more resources, where every classroom in Australia looks like a space that is completely different from today. I'm sure you can all remember going into a dusty, dank and boring space. I remember my first day of school, walking into the classroom. There were rules on the wall. That was it, nothing else. And I thought, how uninspiring. And while I have done my best to turn that place into a creative environment, I know that it's still not good enough because the approach that we have in Australia is that standardised teaching has to be delivered because teachers simply do not have the time to individualise and personalise for every teacher. Sorry, very stupid. As much as I try, I do try my hardest, and I know the teachers around Australia are trying their hardest. But we've got to move beyond this. So I think to end for our discussion, for our side of the debate, I want to look at why we educate our children. Why are we here? and share a personal reflection on why I am in the classroom and why I keep going back even though I know the challenges that we face every day. Even though I know that what my hope for education in Australia is in many ways not necessarily possible. Now, it's not good to think like that. I'm an optimistic guy, full of hope, but I also recognise the funding realities of what we have. A few years ago, I spent some time working for Mike Kelly. He was the federal member for Eden Monero. During this time, we would go around to local schools and we would visit classrooms where the government had funded new school facilities. And it was where I realised 
that what I cared most about was education. I find myself at the back of the room chatting to whoever the student was there and asking them what they wanted to do after school. And what I heard crushed me over and over again. Because students would say, oh, I'd really love to be a graphic designer, but that will never happen. I'd really love to go and be a lawyer in the city, but that's not gonna happen. Over and over and over again, it's not going to happen. A few weeks after, Mike said to me, when we were talking about the White Ribbon, and we were talking about what was happening here at the ANU, I love to see this year uh, what Brian has done with his declaration at the start of the year on that. And we're talking about how women are treated in our society. And he said, sometimes in life, you find things that are unacceptable. And when you define something as unacceptable, you must do something about it. For me, and for I think all of us here today, what is unacceptable is that students can leave school in Australia not feeling worthy of their dreams, not feeling like they will be able to achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve, but feel trapped. And that's where we believe that the classroom needs to radically change. It must become more personalised and responsive. Teachers must be equipped with the resources that they need, the time and the support to actually respond to student needs. We need more welfare, more psychologists in schools. The list goes on and on. And that's why I acknowledge that maybe it won't necessarily happen next year or the year after, but I absolutely hope with people like you in this room caring deeply about this, we will be able to progress this and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, esteemed members of the public of the ANU and those over there. <laughs> ben, I would like to thank you for arguing as the fourth member of our team. I heard you not less than five times talk about every classroom and that yes, the classroom must change. But throughout your talk, it must remain. And we agree. We agree with almost everything you say. For example, thank you. We know that you said that small class sizes are a great thing. But I know the person sitting next to you on your side has written things to the contrary. That indeed. You are much better doing other things. But we agree the classroom needs to be good. So let's think today about what we've heard. We've heard about an alternative reality, a reality that Marty Hughes Warrington referred to, may I uh, point out, talking very quickly. <laughs> Were you actually able to follow what she was saying? <laughs> Talking very quickly, talking about the notion of personal, oh, hey, the minister, <laughs> talking about personalization. But did you think what her personalization meant? She talked about the economic imperative. We're going to personalize under their view via Siri. You're not going to be talking to someone, you're going to be talking to a piece of artificial intelligence. It's not personalized in the sense of involving a person. It will be a tailored computer program that somehow makes you feel good in some way about yourself. And that's only if we get it right. We talked about PISA. We heard 
the other side talk about the importance of PISA. But who are the groups that we look forward to emulating? Finland. What does Finland do? It trains personalized teachers for a personalized classroom. It has teachers in Korea and Singapore and Shanghai who are dedicated to cohorts of students and not traded around like pawns. We have a problem with that in Australia, but it's also how you would do your massive online education. The teachers become commodities who can move around very efficiently from class to class. So, yes, a classroom does not mean the lecture. But is the lecture really dead? After all, you're all here today. <laughs> you're not watching this online. Andrew, there's almost no one watching us online. <laughs> Just like when you talk in front of Parliament. <laughs> Online yes, the people, uh, well, almost no one watches. Uh, has anyone, who here has actually watched Parliament Online? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are weird. <laughs> so, the lecture. The lecture goes back hundreds upon hundreds of years, 800 years. And yes, the lecture is evolving. And there are, as was indicated by the other team, great lectures. Does that mean suddenly because there are bad lectures that we should abandon them? No. Lectures can inspire. You can bring people in and actually meet them, understand them, relate to them, and not realize that you're one of a million people as part of a process. I get to do lectures for a number of people. Why is it that Brian Cox, you all have a chance to see him online, on TV. When he comes to Canberra, 2,000 people pay $100 each to see him. Well, they've seen him electronically, but the classroom setting is what really inspires them. My own MOOC with Paul Francis has been referred to extensively. And yes, 210,000 people have taken that. But you know what's great? When Paul goes through and counts in physics today, the people who have come from all over the world to sit in his classroom, to see Paul, and they've been inspired to come from around the world and actually see the real game. Inequity, yes. Inequity, be, inequity, inequity needs to be countered. What Ms. Hughes Warrington, Dr. Professor Hughes Warrington, I apologize. I really do apologize. What Professor Hughes Warrington has suggested is that we mass produce and rather to address equity by raising all votes, we lower all votes to a commonality that, quite frankly, no one would possibly want. That is a cheap, cheap way out. And it's exactly why she justified it. It's cheap. Education, well, that's the founding of society. They indicate we can't afford good teachers. We cannot afford classrooms. Well, what exactly are we going to be spending the money on? We're spending on the future. What you do to grow the economy, and Dr. Lee, the Honorable Dr. Lee, is an economist <laughs> knows this. He has said to me personally, the most valuable thing that universities do is the value they put in our students. They are the ones who change and drive the economy. And so you want to maximize the value of the education, not lower it to the lowest possible common denominator. But is education just teaching? 
Is it just a one-to-one -one communication? It's certainly not. It is, as indicated by our opposition, it's about peer learning. It's about learning from each other. Now, you can learn a little bit on mass online ways, but not the way on a blackboard as provided in a classroom setting where you can sit and really exchange views, really get to understand people in the intimate setting required to really look at the edge of knowledge. And it's that setting, it's that setting that allows us to do the other thing that we do within classrooms, is provide the beginnings of research. The other side has completely taken away that part of what we do. They have not even addressed it, because they cannot. You do not do research based on this mass setting. Rather, that research comes from the intimate classroom setting that Ben so skillfully argued for on our behalf. <laughs> Andrew, you talked about MOOCs, but you failed to react or to, to, to respond to the rest of my quote. This is a clearly something you've learned in government. <laughs> <laughs> Which was MOOCs allow people around the country to be taught by great teachers. But in order to get the full benefit, they need to be shepherded. They need to have help from fully qualified teachers in their own classroom who can use the best and bring it together for a bigger whole. Uh, I note that uh, Andrew Lee also referred to hobos. At least in a classroom, we have the ability to know who you're being taught by, by the hobos. But on an online setting, you probably are being taught by hobos. <laughs> Here, we figure it out and we move on. We improve things. You have full ability to know who and what you're being looked at. Andrew also talked about the flipped classroom at San Jose and how things learn. But a flipped classroom is exactly what we're talking about. A new dynamic classroom. Not just a MOOC. It's actually a classroom that uses the technology as an adjunct, not as the only game in town. We have done this experiment in Australia. Swinburne Online. They have gone through and used the online platform for teaching. But the dropout rate when Swinburne did this far exceeded the rest of the sector, not just by a little bit, by, by factors of two and three. People are choosing. Oops have their place. But when given a choice, they drop out of them, even when they're paying money. So, you guys are the ones who will choose. The students of Australia and students of the world will choose, and they will choose the great class experience. And it is foolish to believe that we can uh, solve equity with this, because the rich will always choose that, because it is the better option. And so what we are left with, for those advocating for a pure non-classroom experience, is really a bunch of psychopathic, loner, bean counters <laughs> who really only care about getting the hard work done through a technological crutch. And instead, they should be concentrating on how we could avoid this sort of brave new world delusion where we each get very little and instead hold what is dear a great classroom education. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ryan and everyone for their contributions. Now, somebody mysterious texted me in the middle of the, of the debate asking if they could get a brief chance at rebuttal. Was that one of you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm going to do this number. Um, <laughs> What do you guys want to do? Break, break the bubbles and that stuff? I'd say that you can do it.
Parliament online. Oh, except Brian for most of the people in the <laughs> And we really need to keep classroom teachers because they're 800 years old. You know, we need to remember they're as old as leeches and witch burning and slavery. Those are great institutions we never do without. And they've made some other points, but like the rest of you, I was on Facebook by then. <laughs> we on the affirmative side have argued that Getting rid of classrooms is more egalitarian and more democratic. <coughs> We've argued it's fun. You know, it's ironic. This university is led by a man whose Twitter handle is Cosmic Pino, <laughs> but who's favouring a method of education that will ban Pino from being in your hand while you're learning. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are the side who believes you should be able to learn with a glass of Pino in your hand. Naked, lying on the DSD right? As Michael Jackson said, we are the world, we are the future. We are the ones who make a brighter day, so let's start giving up. There's a chance we're making, we're saving our own lives. It's true, we're making a better day, just you and me. Both of Traditional classroom side and ask for questions from the live audience. Hey, uh. <laughs> um, Caitlin and I were just remarking to each other that we have very different learning styles. Um, I am trying to do a MOOC at the moment and struggling beyond belief because I don't have a classroom teacher. Um, and I, uh, in the past, have worked with Indigenous students who really struggle with traditional classroom learning and prefer to be out in the field and doing things directly with the teacher. Do you think that the classroom debate becomes a problem when you're talking about people with very, very vastly different learning styles? Um, Karen, myself, for example. And yes, that's a general comment to kind of give for you. Sorry, are we uh, losing our uh, yeah, specific right. size of the table now? Um, the, the truth is, one of the reasons you might be struggling in your MOOC is that do you need a classroom teacher or do you need actually a, 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 a learning coach in that space? There's been some good research on the US in um, College for America, which showed that people who haven't had access to traditional educational needs, who took roots and had personal coaches who took them through, actually did succeed well in that space. Um, let's not confuse a person standing in front of a class of 30 people or 300 people with somebody who's actually helping you to learn. So we're going to flip the debate from teaching to learning here. So the debate actually asks us to focus on learning. It might not have worked for you because there was nobody there to facilitate your learning in that space. So. I think in my, I've had mixed experiences like yourself in the classroom with um, personalised learning the vast majority of the time. It's not personalised um, and I guess the point I was trying to get across tonight is that I think it should be able um, to be, but the um, biggest barrier to that at the moment is funding and resourcing. Um, but for example, the example I gave was that, um, was a lecture that I have this year who has this semester, sorry, that has tried to personalise um, teaching in the classroom and has tried to make it more engaging. So it is possible um, with what we've got. And I think when you put people online with tens and hundreds of thousands of students, um, even if there are coaches, you know, how do you monitor the quality of that coaching? Um, and it's a lot harder to do that online. Um, and I think that's still an evolving area, um, but you know, Marnie's very well um, versed on MOOCs as opposed to me. But um, I think, like, personally, I 
at the moment would be very adverse to taking the move myself for the reasons that you've just said. That, you know, how, yeah, how do you personalize that? How do you get help? Uh, so uh, there are, you know, issues as you see between how you, you personalize the link. But then within online ways, there are ways of doing it, but they end up requiring people to essentially have a virtual classroom, I would say, uh, type environment. Or I'm talking about individual coaches. But one of the things that uh, Paul has done very effectively in our course is to put in problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is a very effective way at getting students of a variety of different backgrounds to in interact with uh, problems, uh, whether or not it's in the classroom or in our, in our MOOC. Now, the MOOC's pretty sophisticated. The people who can interact with our problems on the MOOC tend to be our most sophisticated students. We could facilitate that with, uh, with some more people. And in the end, what you, you're going to have people helping online, you need to put the resources in. And to think that you can actually uh, provide MOOCs of uh, really high quality, cheaper than in classrooms, not you know, except for the physical infrastructure, uh, I think Marnie can tell you some sad stories of how the AMU at least has not managed to do it. <laughs> Too much information. <laughs> I think it comes to this to the negative side of the table. Um, I've done a lot of learning throughout my years. I've, I've not obviously as many as so many people, but um, I've done six years of me. I've probably had about 60 lectures across my entire degree. I could probably name you two that I've actually engaged with and enjoyed and um, felt like I was learning from. Um, when I had a bad lecture, um, forgive me for pointing this out, but when I've had a bad lecture, I've often put it down to the university is focusing on research and whether they're a researcher not a teacher. Um, so as you were speaking, it, it kind of occurred to me that maybe the move to MOOCs is an actual fact, a mass exodus, and, and us protesting the fact that these teachers are maybe substandard. Um, if, if you are, I suppose, pushing that classroom agenda, how do you improve that and what, what, would you, what steps would you take to make that better for us? Mark's in charge of this for the university. But <laughs> <laughs> to, to clarify, I didn't go to AMU just so you know. <laughs> There's a whole range of reasons why people don't engage, and your story is not unusual, unfortunately. People do have a whole range of reasons why they don't, they don't go. I've met some people at AMU who don't go to a single lecture because they use the time to work on their research and do all the things that they want to get done. They have positive reasons for not being there, as well as reasons for saying, you know, this person talks too slow, or I can listen to it, or I don't need to listen to it because they're actually just telling me what's in the textbook. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the fundamental issue for me is it's not just about what students want. It's actually we've got ourselves into a situation where we haven't really thought, this can't be fun for staff either. Mm? It can't be. If, if the drivers are somewhere else and there's a model of teaching where you're not having fun either, then something's really fundamentally broken. So actually make no apologies for putting the thermal data out there and showing that people are doing exactly what you're saying, which is for whatever reason, they are not attending lectures and other events after week three because they've made their mind up that they're going to do it in other different ways. Okay? That's mutually unsatisfactory for everybody. And the truth is, unfortunately, every university in the world does this. So who's going to start the change and who's going to lead to uh, the change in 800 years of practice? Sure, we could modify the lecture. There are some people that do lecture well. And the MIT data shows that lectures of less than six minutes seem to work a lot better for people. But when we, when we talk to the guys in physics, they say lectures delivered at double speed is actually more effective for a lot of people. At six minutes, with the handwritten notes, getting quite complex ideas across. That's, that's exactly what they do want to do. But the most important thing is they're having more fun. So the bit that's lost in all of this is if you want to improve classroom teaching, you have to help teachers to do better. There's quite a million teachers out there in high schools across Australia. There's a lot of university teachers out there who are probably not up to date in the training, not given access to the training they need, and probably not having fun. So uh, we've lost something there, and that's the love of education. So I completely agree with where you're at. Uh, the point is we have to do something about this. If we allow this to keep going, then we're not actually solving the problem. Just to take our team hat off for a moment, I think one of the challenges is uh, that a, a function that classroom teachers at school and university have served very well uh, is 
uh, acting as a discipline to turn up. Uh, and one of the big challenges as MOOCs roll out and people start moving to online will be how we work out how to serve that motivational role. There must be a whole bunch of different ways of doing this, both involving sort of interpersonal interaction and changing incentives and setting up habits and so on. But the habit of attending lecture, lectures has proven a surprisingly durable way of getting a large information, amount of information across to people in a few years. Uh, I don't think we've quite figured out how to nail that motivational bit. My own experience is that uh, lectures are good for certain types of things. Uh, narratives, narrative stories, storytelling. Uh, they're not very good at giving you base information. Uh, I think uh, the flip classroom is very good at getting short six minute bits where you can get that idea you had, practice a little bit, and go at your own pace, take 15 minutes, and go to something else. Have a glass of peanut butter in your hand. <laughs> I don't think it's strictly uh, illegal at AMU to have wine in the classroom, of course, yeah. is it? Yeah, okay, well, there you go. It's not going to change that. Uh, uh, but, but as I said, uh, well, I said we could, but Marty's in charge. The mic's on. I said we could, it was suggested. But you need to understand the, 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 the different um, things that work well. And as I said, I personally think that uh, in many areas, these problem-based learning styles or small group styles where you work on things together and you contextualize the little short bits that you learn in six-minute hunks is a good way. But then we have a story. For example, when I tell the Accelerated Universe story, that's a good 45-minute lecture. Um, it really is. Brian Cox gives a great 90 minute lecture because it's a story. And those are useful, they're inspiring. But you probably don't need 18 of them unless uh, in a row. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's something that we are stuck in the past. And the other thing we have to realize is that as a, as a university, uh, but more so as a, a part of society, we do not train our teachers in pedagogy and how to do this. And we're starting, but you know, we really are, are rowing about the other direction uh, of doing this. And you know, people have many reasons for being here. And convincing them that being excited about their teaching is one of them is one of my jobs. It's hard, or Martin's job. I don't know if this is totally breaking the rules, but I just wanted to pick up on the second half of that question and throw back to my colleagues here, um, whether there is an aspect of incentives in all of this too. You know, the, the incentives, you know, the, 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 the publisher parish, you know, the, the real need to drive and how university funding flows and all of that. I mean, I think we can ignore kind of a structural issue perhaps. Well, what I can say is we're changing that. So you want to get promoted to professor right now, you better have a good teaching portfolio because you're not going to get uh, you need to do both things now. We, we, about three years ago, we went across the university and we asked students and staff and we asked other university students because we wanted a baseline. Um, what are the things that we need to do to transfer on learning and teaching at ANU? What could we change? And we were really focused on digital platforms and we thought, ah, oh, you know, what do we need to do? And people said, of course, fix the wireless. And we went, okay, that's just really, <laughs> really obvious. <laughs> that's right. Actually, the answers, the, the most common answer we got was not a digital question. It was could you please just encourage people to see teaching as important and value it? And that was coming from staff as well as from students. And so we've been working really hard to put incentives in place in promotion to make it the case that you can't apply for academic promotion at ANU unless you do have a teaching case. And that teaching case has to be on evidence and you can't just have a pulse. You actually have to generate impact and change in your classroom. So we have done that for a couple of years. And Interestingly enough, we, we now get, in, I mean, I get invites from other universities to come and talk about how we've been changing things and trying to close the loop there to say, what's the driver here? How do we encourage? But it can be tough because academics have a lot of pressures on their time. <coughs> but my view is if you want to have the greatest research impact of all, and pass it on to the next generation. I mean, that's just a fundamental Aristotelian point. You want to be immortal, give it to the next generation, basically. But then, hang on, of course, what, what can I say? <laughs> I'm teaching a high school in the public system as well, and I just wanted to ask the question, how much do you think universities focus on ATAR entry points in towards the non-personalisation of education? 
And is there a possibility for a change? Uh, yes, <laughs> because um, so ANU has the highest median ATAR entry threshold in the country, and that's fantastic. But the higher and higher that number goes, the less diversity we can see in some ways. So for the past three years, with great thanks to the generosity of the Tuck Halls, we introduced the Tuck Hall Scholarship System, which um, for every 25 scholarships, we get about 750 applications. We ask students to tell us not just about their ATAR, but tell us about their co-curriculum, what they do outside the classroom, the context they're coming from. So there are some poor people that have suffered this process down the front here. Um, for every 25 scholarships we go, we've been offering about 125 more scholarships per year, and we've been using that process as a pilot to actually put ourselves on a trajectory where we can say it's not just academic results that matter. We fundamentally care about the place you come from, the difficulties that you've had, and the context outside of the classroom, because these tell us about your resilience, they tell us about your skills, and often those skills are just as a good predictor of, of um, employment as those academic outcomes. Don't get me wrong, ATAR is actually a very good predictor of academic performance and it's a very good predictor of academic dropout. But it doesn't always tell you whether the person's going to get a great job. So we are absolutely committed to trying to change that and at the same time being transparent and being very honest about that as well. I'm sure Brian probably won't have some good thoughts on that as well. So, I mean, I think this is absolutely essential that we, um, if you only use ATAR, you're going to get students from, uh, you know, essentially almost exclusively from uh, the upper socioeconomic um, classes of Australia, because that's where most of it's con concentrated. So, when I see that our median ATAR now is up in the 93s, that's really, when Marty does scale ATAR, where your performance at university, it actually starts breaking down. It's not clear that you're better at 98 than at 93 in most subjects. Uh, math, pure mathematics, probably, but not too many. I don't know. Uh, the I think the, the main point is we, we also know that there's another variable, which is socioeconomic status of our individuals. Uh, in the end, ANU is a small place. It's a national university, and we really want to have a cohort here that represents Australia. And yes, we want to have very high achievers from around Australia, but we want them not just to be the people who can be here because they're rich enough to be here or grow up in here, but they need to be much more representative of Australia as a whole. So you know, that's one of the big jobs that uh, Marnie has, uh, and I'm very enthusiastic about, uh, is to figure this out. And we're going to be trailblazing, blazing in this, uh, and changing the way we do things. But not everyone can come to ANU. It's going to be a, a cohort, but we want it to be a better cohort. And a better cohort means something other than can I just add, I had the privilege the other week to spend a number of hours with a gentleman named Tony Wagner who works at Harvard's Innovation Labs and you can look him up online, he's got a pretty cool TED talk. Um, and he talks about the move from kind of content mastery into competencies uh, and that you can actually start thinking about assessing competencies and not just content. Um, and, and I think what's really exciting to hear uh, both uh, Ronnie and Brian talk about is in his in his discussion uh, with me he and, and with a broader group as well he really emphasized that if we want to see the way that our k-12 schooling is uh, prep to 12 schooling is, is conducted universities actually um, will will be able to set the pace because if it if they are shifting the way in which they're assessing uh, who gains entry and and what is value um, beyond content again towards competence that will that will kind of go up river, if you will, um, and so just get on. Just uh, before I came here, I was meeting with some of the Year Ten students individually with their parents, and what we're doing we introduced this last year. Uh, a couple of the teachers volunteered to uh, have a, I guess, a interview with them to discuss their transition from Year Ten to Year Eleven and Twelve. Some of you might not be aware, but in the ACT, we've separated our middle schools, year 7 to 10, with the year 11 and 12 schools, colleges. And they are continuously assessed from day one uh, when they step foot in college, in year 11, in the ACT, and it's treated much more like university. So we really need to make sure we're supporting our students to transition from year 10 to year 11 into a completely different environment, where they need to be much more self-sufficient but the challenge that I have whenever I meet with these parents and discuss the, the transition arrangement 
is that the focus of the discussion is on the ATAR. The focus of the discussion is on how do we gain the system? Because they all want to achieve very well. Their focus is on getting as high an ATAR as possible. And I find that really difficult. And, uh, and we have a discussion about whether that's right or wrong uh, while, while we're there. Um, and I leave it up to them on how they work out what they want to do. I encourage them to follow their passion and then what they're most interested in. But I find it very difficult that we have this system where children, you know, they're 14 and 15, some of them, and they're already aware of this, this goal to get this particular mark. And they were saying to me, one of them, oh, you know, maybe I should stop doing the Taekwondo and because, I mean, I really love it, but maybe it, I won't be able to study as much. And I just find that uh, both difficult and ridiculous. And I think we've got to move away from that pressure. I think it is important to have, no question there. But I think the system really does need to encourage students to follow their passion, to, to really express themselves and to work out who they are and not focus on this uh, high achievement around a grade, more about learning as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, just a small comment as well. I think one of the big issues for high school students transitioning to university as well when it comes to ATAR is that the ATAR entry is actually based on the supply and demand of the course, not on the difficulty of that course. So while the ATAR, as Marnie said, you know, like there is a, a lot of arguments for that being an indicator of a student's ability, that doesn't translate into them being able to get into a course that they're actually capable of. Um, so I think that that's another um, part of that system that just doesn't line up yet. And, we haven't been able to um, I'm feeling a little bit like a dinosaur, 30 years in the classroom, um, moving from slide rules and logbooks to calculators and online virtual learning environments. But I'd like to point out a couple of things. One, this is a very privileged audience. I work with kids who don't have anywhere to sleep, who don't eat and we're not doing anything about them. So I have a couple of questions for the panel. Um, Andrew, what is the Labor, a prospective Labor government going to do about that? Are you going to fund Gonski? Um, Melody, you talked about Teach for Australia. Um, Teach for Australia has been quite successful, but part of that is the amount of funding that's gone into training those individual teachers. So Andrew, is the Labor, a prospective Labor government going to put more money into training all teachers across the country? rather than the privilege for you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great question. So we had an event uh, just up in the foyer up here last night with Jenny Macklin launching Labor's Growing Together Plan to tackle inequality. Uh, at the heart of that is saying that one of the big debates in the next election is going to be over inequality and one of Labor's big responses to dealing with the rise in inequality that sees inequality now at a 75 year high in Australia uh, is going to be to properly fund God's uh, And making sure that all schools have the resources they need doesn't guarantee outcomes, as you know, uh, but it does make them possible. Uh, and people who say that, uh, that it, the resources are irrelevant miss the, the potential to, uh, to make a difference. I think we do need to look at opportunities for ensuring that uh, our most effective teachers are working in the most, uh, some of the most disadvantaged schools. Uh, at the moment we have some great teachers working in disadvantaged schools, but if you look at the data, uh, you, you look for example at the average number of years of experience by the SES decile of the school, you find that more um, schools in more advantaged neighbourhoods tend to have more experienced teachers. I'd like to look at ways of turning that around. That's a pattern you see if you look right across public and private sectors. It's a pattern you see if you just look within the, within the public sector. Uh, so making sure that we don't have teachers training on poor kids so they can finish their careers on rich kids is, is important. Uh, and Labor's committed to, to putting the money there uh, in order to, to make sure that we've got that, that potential. I hope the government come on board, but one of the reasons we made a bunch of tough decisions around multinational tax, high-end superannuation, and changing negative gearing was precisely so that we could fund Gonski. Um, 
just to, to add, I think from a Teach for Australia perspective, uh, we see the investment as partly an investment into schools that need additional support. And one of the things that we seek to do in the training that we provide, not only to our teachers, um, but more globally in the program, is to ensure that we're helping additional teachers in the schools, the mentors and others, um, to have additional uh, ability to do peer coaching, uh, to do um, uh, support of any new teacher within those schools. We're making investments not just in the individuals themselves that are coming through uh, a different way of entering into teaching, but actually the partner schools with whom we work. Um, and just a, a note, because not, not often people know, um, of the associates that are staying on in teaching, the alumni who are staying on in teaching, which are um, a substantial proportion of them, like 64%, are staying on in about five, six, seven years uh, worth of data. 75% um, of those are staying on in disadvantaged schools. So the, the pattern that you were just talking about, Andrew, is something that we're actively trying to, to address through, through the program that we run. So, as a, as a Teach for Australia associate and a, an AU member like yourself, uh, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that uh, funding for initiatives that goes towards getting inspiring and excited young people into schools as teachers is fantastic and should be increased, not just uh, for Teach for Australia as an organisation, but across the board to provide as much training and support as possible for new and early entry teachers into the profession. We also need to look at making sure that there is funding available to support teachers that are in schools already, uh, teachers with ongoing PD, making sure that there's a professional development continuing and that there's mentoring support, so support for people who are providing mentor for people like myself. But um, I'd also just like to flag one of the criticisms that um, people uh, often uh, level at Teach for Australia is that people come in and go out and I think it's something that the organisation spends a lot of time refuting. And I think that's good, but I think it's also important to acknowledge what do the people do that have done the Teach for Australia program and are no longer in the classroom. And I must say I have uh, two friends right now, uh, one of them who is on a Rhodes Scholarship from ANU, uh, who did the Teach for Australia program, doing research right now in Oxford, uh, focused on education, and is fundamentally committed to combating educational inequality in Australia when they come back. There's another member uh, who did uh, associateship in the same year, stayed on, and then is now working at an education research think tank. Another came and spoke in my classroom just the other day, works for UNICEF China, uh, combating educational inequality in, in China, and bringing what lessons she has back here to Australia later on. So I think when we look at this program, and when we see whether teachers are staying on or not, the question that I ask yourself, myself, and I think we should all ask ourselves is, is funding going towards combating educational inequality in various different ways at a high level. These people, I believe, and I firmly believe, will go on to be very influential in their various different fields. And it is fundamentally important that we have people who are influential, who have a deep understanding of what it is like in disadvantaged schools in Australia, and a deep commitment to go on and do something about that. I think that's a, that's a conversation that's missing where people uh, have, a, have a bit of a dig at Teach for Australia. So that's like something I think is really important for us to acknowledge. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, so, Marnie, you touched on uh, in your speech, you highlighted that in large lecture theatres, for example, that the lecturers they don't really have a, an understanding on the personal learning journey or the names of some of the students. And I'm really glad that Claudia picked up on that and said that in MOOCs, um, that can be more the case where you've got tens and hundreds of thousands of students. Uh, and then Melanie, you uh, were talking about the classroom and teachers, they provide support that extends far beyond academia. In fact, Ben, you said previously that uh, one of the greatest things you can give to students is they get the confidence that they can achieve anything they want. So with that in mind, um, this question is uh, open to everybody. How can we make these MOOCs, these online courses, which inevitably will be the future of education, how can we make them more personable? So I have a MOOC taker as well as a MOOC 
support her. Um, and the last one, I did take the actuarial one, which I quite liked. But I actually took a MOOC on the superheroes. So I'm now an expert in all things superheroes. So ask me later. <laughs> I don't know most of it, but I actually did learn. One of the great things that I saw, and it was a Smithsonian uh, MOOC, was that they actually used peer marking and peer learning extraordinarily effectively. And I was given a peer marker for that. There were 14,000 people enrolled in the course. And I had a peer marker all the way through who was trained. I was myself trained to peer mark other people. And it was actually just like going to the gym with somebody who's from similar, and we got there together. I mean, the point is, it, every day, when you work in the space, you see something new like that happen. And the point, the really important point about this is it's actually based on evidence. One of the things that I kind of frustrates me about teaching is that a lot of the things we do are habitual. We do them because we've always done them. And a lot of the argument about education is assertive and anecdotal, and it's not based on, it's not based on behavioural evidence, it's not based on outcomes. So I actually think there's a whole variety of ways in which we can change what we do. I think the point was made before that there's different ways that people like to learn. I've seen different approaches across this university, but one thing I do insist upon is people do actually collect the data. One of the issues I've got is when the data's been collected in the classroom of 30, it's very hard to, to extrapolate. When we do look at the MOOC data that we've got, we get data from 15,000 people, and we can get a much better sense of what is affected and what's not affected. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do, Brody, is we actually insist that education practice be based upon evidence and based upon data, and we make our decisions on the basis of the evidence and the data and be prepared to make some tough decisions. I think the students as well, like on a very superficial level too with MOOCs, is you know, thinking about what the students want to get out of their courses, like do they want to get information? And to a point, every course does require you to have information dumped on you essentially, um, whether you're doing law, whether you're doing science, um, whether you're doing politics or engineering, you need to be taught the level of information. I think one of the biggest criticisms, particularly in the undergraduate sphere about courses is where that then translates into the real world and into the practical skills that are going to get them a job. And while you can have in a MOOC someone telling you all about Con, 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 I don't do law, I'm just off the top of my head, there's a course called Con Con. Um, well, you can be taught all about that. How do you practically apply that? How are you then going to learn um, to be able to present evidence in court and things like that? And at the moment, I haven't, I don't know, Amani might be able to refute this, um, but I think those practical skills are still something that students really want and want to be able to practice in the real world with other people there because still in the real world, we, the majority of jobs still require at least some face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so it is still an important skill um, that's needed, but of course MOOCs can play into the realm of a holistic approach to education. Just a very quick uh, response to the Brody. Uh, one of the things to build on uh, what Marty's saying, the philosophy of test, learn and adapt uh, can be done much more effectively with, uh, with MOOCs than other types of online learning, so we can do better on the baseline. One of the most terrifying things I noticed in uh, teaching economics was reading a number of books about, the, uh, uh, the about economic education, which found that a year after doing first year economics, uh, a majority of students uh, could not answer a bunch of straightforward questions around trade-offs, comparative advantage, uh, fallacy of the sunk cost, marginal, the thinking of the margin rather than the average, suggesting that they'd lost most of, lost or never had, most of what we would hope a first year economic student uh, ought to have. So we, we ought to be much more rigorous in terms of running randomised trials on this. One of the lovely things Khan Academy is doing is there's a host of randomised trials going on. There's randomised trials of their maths uh, teaching in community colleges, US Department of Education spending $3 million in an RCT there. There's randomised trials as how they're working in very deprived parts of South Africa, uh, looking at whether or not cheap Khan Academy education can, uh, can make a difference, uh, but, uh, but being very, very rigorous with uh, testing them as, as rigorously as we would test a new pharmacy at all. Can we do maybe uh, up the back in the new? Hi, I'm Ebony. Um, 
so I'm a fourth year AMU student, and this is mostly a question for undergrads because I actually don't know a lot about postgrad at AMU. Um, so my question is, uh, we kind of focus on making thought leaders, which is wonderful. Um, however, we have noted tonight like, the importance of other people's skills and values and other things that they offer. However, all our assessments, 90% of our assessments, because we do have true participation for most classes, are based on academic research of other people. Um, even when we do group assignments, the assessment's always on the final report, not the group meetings or group dynamics or you know, our minute-taking skills. Um, my question is, do you think by focusing on making thought leaders that we're not making very good leaders as a whole? <laughs> Please don't follow me on the thought leaders. Look, what you're fundamentally asking there is one of the big uh, bugbears we have and students have is around group assessment. So assessment in group settings. So it's a, a challenging thing to do because when we do propose it, there's often objections from students and objections from staff. Is my individual contribution going to be noticed? And that ranges across the university. So we've been working really hard to try and unravel that and say, to be honest with you, what you need is what we call authentic assessment, which is if you're going to go and practice law, if you're going to go and do these things, see the assessment has got to be somehow reflective of what you're going to need to be able to do. The average lawyer, the average economist, is going to have to be able to deal with really complex bundles of problems that walk through the door and are not tidily delineated into a 2,000 word essay, okay? But it requires a shift, right? One of the issues is if your driver is elsewhere and you don't see the need to do that, then you're not gonna do it. So one of the things we do do is we just persist in arguing and persist in trying to show that actually we do need to do this. And the best evidence we've got is the employment rates for the university uh, and keeping those, keeping the retention rates going, but showing the employment rates and the engagement rates later on. So unfortunately that's lag data, but I can, I can tell you we do have that debate over and over and over again, and we are persisting, and all our training and support for teachers at the university is around authentic learning. Um, unfortunately there were 4,168 courses at this university, could I guarantee that you were getting a great authentic assessment task in every single one? No, I cannot. Okay, but the truth is we are actually intending and the, and the institution is devoted to that and that's why we love getting student feedback in the University Education Committee around these policies and students, I have to say, have been absolutely sensational in getting reform. Now here's a little factoid for you around the assessment policy. I told this to Brian the other day. ANU is the only university in Australia and in fact the world as far as I know that has what's called a negotiated assessment policy. And I don't know if you recall this, Andrew, when you were teaching here. You actually have the right at the beginning of the semester to go in and negotiate around the assessment tasks. And you didn't know that's actually been in ANU policy. I don't know. It's been around for about 15 years, that policy. Now, it's not always understood. It's there in policy. Uh, when the federal regulator came to visit us, um, and they expect every piece of assessment to be set out, they looked at that policy and they said, what planet are you on? And we said, we're on planet high achievement. <laughs> Students like to be able to negotiate, and if the assessment's out of date, not relevant, not authentic, or it's not stretching them, they should be able to negotiate, okay? So you actually do, in policy, have the right to engage with your class to debate and to get authentic learning types. And if you think you need group learning, then you ask for it, okay? So there it is, you've learned something tonight, haven't you? Yeah. 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 I learned something about this when she told me uh, just on that, the best course I had at ANU is where, we, where one of the lecturer encouraged us to come and negotiate the assessment. Uh, with that. Now, there was only one, so uh, I, uh, I know that um, it is difficult, and I don't remember ever feeling comfortable with doing that while I was here, so I think there might be a need to kind of reform how that's done at the start of the year, maybe encouraging the academics to uh, embrace that. But um, I remember I was doing a, a sociology course, and there were two essays on various topics that weren't really going to be really useful for me. It was in my final semester, I was about to go into the classroom, and I negotiated to change it to one very large assessment piece where I was looking at uh, drug and alcohol education in schools and sociology of that. And it became very practical and real for me, and probably one of the most enjoyable tasks I did while I was here. Um, so there is the possibility to do that, to sort of push it out a little bit, or hopefully have a, uh, a lecture that's um, very willing to accommodate your needs. But one thing, I totally agree with you, while you're here, I did feel that it's very academic and uh, very text heavy, very writing heavy. And what I would, I would personally love to see uh, a model where there were less lectures and more tutorials where students had to attend and come and, and teach each other. 
and uh, where students throughout their time at ANU would learn how to be the greatest facilitators of knowledge generation in the country. I think if you could say that you will leave ANU with the ability to learn, to research, and to really teach and develop and share your ideas, then you've got something extra, that kind of that gold star that, that other universities just absolutely won't have. I think it is possible here, particularly with the on-campus living arrangement. And I think that it's really good to see uh, yourself, particularly and both of you, pushing for that to, to be extended and have more people living on campus. But I think absolutely there needs to be more interaction between students, particularly more peer-to-peer -peer learning within higher education. So I've done a lot of things, and um, I grew up in eastern suburbs of Sydney, so I've got pretty good access to internet technology. And I sometimes had trouble learning all the content that's necessary to do this. Um, so I, we've heard a lot tonight of people referring to uh, online learning and online te technology as being equalizers, but I was wondering how you guys saw that being kind of understood with the same way that a lot of the people who need that equalizer best, people in rural areas or from disadvantaged backgrounds, may not be able to afford to have access to the technology that they need for that to actually equalize their learning opportunities. Uh, sorry, in the interest of time, this might be the last question. I'm really sorry. So, I mean, one thing to realize is that it uh, depends on the platform you use. So, for example, edX allows you to go all sorts of different bandwidth levels. So you should be able to get things over even a kind of a crappy GPMS uh, telephone link if you're really desperate. And, so, and that technology is improving. Um, unless you happen to be on a rural piece of land like I am, where the NBM is scheduled to come to me. Yeah. But that's another story. Uh, but but I, do, I do think there, uh, it, it is literally a technology issue. And so we're going to find that uh, governments of the world, governments of Australia, provide that technology, which is internet connectivity in the same way that will be seen as the same way of having a road coming to your place. It's going to be that important. And so, you know, that's why the country is spending a lot of money on the NBN. Uh, people like me, who tend not to be in the sweet spot, um, not so happy. But the reality is I can, I can do a roof at my house uh, with the right technology. If you have a bad platform, you're right. It's too heavy, mine will fall over. But I, I think it's, uh, even in Africa, people, I mean, I have a lot of people in the middle of Africa taking our move. And they, that's with a, a mobile phone connection. And you know, it's the technology of two years from now be even much better. That's right. I mean, it's like building classrooms, the fundamental infrastructure is really critical. Um, the two things that I think have been most surprising for me as an educator is one, you've just alluded to that, when you go to places in Africa, people are using mobile phones. So you, you anticipate that low um, socioeconomic communities are not getting access that and you assume that what's happening in Australia is happening there, it's not, it's really interesting. I've been in a number of, of developing contexts where they've actually had better digital infrastructure than Australia has, and that's nothing to be proud of. So I've seen kids in Africa and I've also seen kids in the Asia Pacific region who are actually gaining access to a mix. We have an obligation to produce those on low bandwidth. At the very lowest bandwidth, you can actually just download the text. So you can actually see the text and you don't want you can actually fill it. Um, but the truth is, I think some of our problems in Australia are not global problems, but this is fundamental. So rather than spend the money on pouring concrete into tiered lecture theatres, everyone tells me spend more money on wireless. And there's no doubt that that is the best investment on this campus, and it's probably one of the best investments that we can have for societal transformation, is to invest in access to information. Because I totally get where you're coming from. It's great if you're on the east coast in Sydney, but we also teach teachers out in, in rural and regional communities who are really frustrated by how poor the digital infrastructure is in Australia. Um, and this is uh, arguably one of the best investments you can make. Just we've covered a range of different topics, but all of them are fundamentally linked to government policy. 
uh, whether it's IT infrastructure, education funding, teacher quality, uh, independent schools, whatever it is that you're interested in or looking at. It's very important that each of you here actually make sure that for whatever federal member uh, you have, uh, when there is the double disillusion or, or not, you must, you must really actively think about that as an election issue, but not just think about it, make sure you voice your concerns. Uh, whatever party you support, it is very important that for me and for the students in my classroom, education is a top political issue. And uh, while I know Andrew and his colleagues are doing their very best to make sure that's the case, I'm not seeing it from the broad political landscape. I think we're, we're talking a lot about the economy and innovation, and really, there's a real challenge when you are trying to innovate with people who really have been left behind because of their postcode or their economic status, and they haven't been given the resources to actually give it a go to be able to innovate. So I just think it's really important to highlight that while we're here talking about this tonight, there are various ways you can actually do something about that yourself. You don't need to be a teacher like some of us here to really passionately care about this and voice your concerns to those who can potentially do something about it at some point. Well said. I won't add to Ben's terrific uh, non-party political advertisement, but I do, <laughs> I do think that the last conversation has really uh, highlighted one of the key challenges here. You know, our debate in some sense is a, is a meaningless debate because the way in which we deliver education is changing and uh, all of us support making sure that works. But I think making sure that, that also that people don't fall through the cracks, uh, that this isn't uh, great online learning for people who have more money, faster broadband and more expensive computers, but it's actually something that manages to lift all boats and, and that'll be one of the chief challenges ahead uh, as we try and make sure that this, this evolution uh, raises the, the, the educational standards right across the board. Thank you very much today, everyone, and I'd like to give our speakers another round of applause. Um, on the note of how you can, one of the ways that you can make a difference in education, um, we are obvious this event is run by Teach for Australia, and we have some alumni and associates outside who are really keen to talk to you about the program and any, answer any questions you can you have. Um, if you are interested in the program outside, and there will also be some cheese and a booster. Um, I'd like to give um, some gifts to our speakers uh, to thank them once again for their time.